great to see everyone this evening. It is good to see David back with us two times in a row today. I'm glad that his surgery went well. It's always good to have good news uh, about our brethren who are having problems and their surgeries go as they're planned. You know, there's a serious problem that is developing in the church today that has already developed in our nation. And that is that nobody wants to do anything. It's like we've developed this welfare attitude that you owe me everything, but I owe you nothing. <clears throat> Excuse me. As we consider the significance of Christianity, there's a few things that we first need to realize. First of all, we need to realize that every right implies a responsibility. Every opportunity implies an obligation. And every possession implies a duty. Enjoying Christian fellowship with God involves accepting the responsibilities that are inherent in that relationship. You see, duty without doctrine is like a tree without roots. But doctrine without duty is like a tree without fruit. Have you ever thought about the fact that the Christian is a person that is called into God's service? I think the Thessalonians understood that because I want you to listen to what Paul said of them in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. He said, For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God were to spread abroad, so that we need not speak anything. For they themselves show of us what manner of entering in we had unto you, and how ye turned to God from idols to serve... Notice that word, serve, the true and the living God. <clears throat> Each and every one of us who are in the Lord, we have an obligation to fulfill our individual service. I think we all need to be like Tychicus that Paul described in Colossians 4 verse 7 as a faithful minister and a fellow servant in the Lord. So let's explore this evening how we are actually saved to serve. Now, we have to understand, of course, that the kingdom, which is the church, is actually a realm of activity. It is not to be a realm of idleness. This fact is seen in the various designations that is used to describe Christians, members of that body. In John chapter 15, verses 1 through 8, Jesus describes his followers as branches. And the reason he describes us as branches is because we are to bear fruit. In 2 Corinthians 9, verse 6, we're described as farmers. And we are to sow the word, the seed of God, into the hearts of men. In 2 Timothy 2, verses 3 through 4, we are described as soldiers because we are to war a good warfare. In 1 Corinthians 9, verses 24 through 27, we're described as athletes running a race. And in Romans 12, verses 3 through 8, we're described as members who uses our talents for the good of the body. <clears throat> so as Christians, we are to be fruitful. We see that in the parable of the soils in Matthew 13. We're to be useful, vessels fit for the master's use, 2 Timothy 2, verses 20 and 21. And we are to be profitable, as Eliphaz has asked Job about that in Job chapter 22, verse 2. But in all this, we see that Christians are a part of a kingdom of activity. So as Christians, our aim is to do his will. Now notice Jesus' attitude about all of this in John 6, verse 38. He said, For I came down from heaven not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. Is this our attitude toward the giver of every good and every perfect gift? Do we have the same attitude that Jesus had to do his will and not mine? If it isn't, we need an attitude change. Remember that God, doing God's will is doing what pleases God, not what pleases us. Paul said in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 9, Wherefore we labor, notice the action word right there, we labor that whether present or absent, we may be accepted of him. A non-active Christian places their soul in great jeopardy. Jesus made it very plain there in Matthew 25, verses 31 through 46, that when we don't do good things to our brethren, 
we are not serving God. And such will go away into everlasting punishment. It is that serious with God. The spiritual freeloader, the one who's just along for the ride, is going to be sadly disappointed when judgment day comes. And there's not going to be any excuses that are accepted. We learn that in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21 through 23. When we stand before the great judge, we will hear the words, He hath done what he could, Matthew 14, verse 8. Or, I never knew you, depart from me, Matthew, or Matthew 7, verse 23. And what we hear really depends upon our choice, what we decide to do in this life. Now, Christians are identified as a people of activity in God's word. In the scriptures, they're described as workers. I want you to listen to Paul as he described the Thessalonians in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 3. He says, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and your labor of love. These people were not idle, they were not lazy, they were active. Paul urged Timothy to activity. In 2 Timothy 2, verse 15, he said, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. Now, Christians are also described by the word laborers. Jesus did this in Matthew 9, verse 37 and 38, when he said, The harvest is truly plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore the Lord of the harvest that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. And again, Jesus said in John 7, 27, 6, 27, Labor not for the meat which perisheth, but for that meat which endureth unto everlasting life, which the Son of Man shall give unto you. As workers, there are two kinds of activities that the Christian is to be involved in. Of course, first and foremost, we're to be involved in the work of the Lord. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, Be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. <clears throat> Working for God is not just commanded, but it's also profitable. Because God is the rewarder of them that diligently seek him, Hebrews 11, verse 6. The second type of activity that we have to be involved in is something called good works. Jesus tells us there in the great Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5, verse 16, Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works. And the purpose was that they may glorify your Father which is in heaven. The Apostle Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 12, Having your conversation honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, notice, your good works which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. By our good works, others may glorify God. Plus, when we do good works, we become more like our Lord Jesus Christ because he went about doing good, Acts chapter 10, verse 38. If you are a willing worker, according to Hebrews 13, 21, God is able to make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing his sight through Jesus Christ. When we determine to work for God, he's there to help us. As we think about our Christian work, we need to be honest with ourselves. We need to be asking ourselves questions concerning our abilities and our opportunities. Now, concerning our abilities, here's some questions I think it might do us good to ask ourselves. In what way am I especially blessed by God? What has me, he blessed me with as far as my abilities? What do I possess? that I can use in the Lord's work? What can I derive from doing these things? What kind of a fulfillment can I derive? And what do I enjoy doing? What comes to me naturally? And then, what can I learn to do? See, too many people think that, well, <clears throat> I'm just a one-talent man. This is all I can do, and so take it or leave it. But there's a thing called growth. 
We can learn to do more if we put our minds to it. And that's what God expects us to do. Remember the one talent man who hid his talent and refused to gain more? It was not a pretty sight for him. Concerning our opportunities, there's questions we also need to ask. <clears throat> like, what needs to be done in the Lord's work? Look around you. Look around what needs to be done. What can we do? What scriptural restrictions govern the work? You know, there's some things that women are not allowed to do that men can. So what we need to do is look at the scriptural requirements. What other factors may limit my opportunity? Once we grow older, there's things that we used to could do, but we can't do now. But we may be fit for something even better as we grow older. What is now being done inadequately? You see something that's lacking? Don't complain to the elders. Go see if you can help alleviate the situation. What problems exist that need to be solved? And what are others doing that I need to help do? You know, it's oftentimes people get stuck with a job. I say that. But they have a job. Nobody wants to do it. And it's like they're stuck with it, and nobody wants to do it. We need to see if some of these people may need some help with their labor. These questions, I think, help to provoke us unto loving good works. But we need to ask these questions honestly. We also need to develop certain attitudes concerning our Christian work. We need to have the gratitude of the privilege of working for the Lord, like Paul 1 Timothy 1, verse 12, where he said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he hath counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Do we thank God for the ability that we have to serve him? You know, sadly, most people complain for having to serve. We should count it a joy to serve. And here's something that is needed more than anything. Having the initiative to go and do the work without having to be prodded to do so. We need to be an example of the believers. Take the initiative. As we work for the Lord, we also need to be positive. Do all things without disputings and murmurings. Philippians 2.14 We need to be enthusiastic about it. God loves a cheerful, cheerful giver whether we're giving of our means or giving of our abilities. And finally, let's be persistent. Let's not be weary and well-doing, Galatians chapter 6, verse 9. So yes, Christians are to be servants. We are saved to serve. And there's five different Greek words used in the New Testament to emphasize this fact of servanthood. The first one is found in Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. It's the Greek word mimetai, and it literally means to be a follower or an imitator. And yes, we are to imitate our Lord Jesus Christ, who went about doing good. The second is mathetai, translated as disciples in John 8, verse 31. The third is oikonomos, meaning steward. It's found in 1 Peter 4, 10. The fourth is diakonos, and it's translated as minister in Romans 15, verse 25, but also as deacon in other places. And the fifth word is the word doulos. It's translated as servant in Luke chapter 17, verse 10, and implies a bond servant. So let's notice what it actually means to be a servant, in case you don't know. Servanthood is the outward evidence of a shift in focus away from self and it's seen in action. We cannot ever become the servants of God until we focus on the love of God with all of our hearts, soul, and mind, Matthew 22, 37. And in like manner, we cannot become servants to our fellow men if we don't love them like ourselves, verse 39. And being a servant has to be a way of life. It's not an occasional good deed, but it is a, a vocation with us, and it involves the entire frame of mind. We have to have the mindset of a servant to be a true servant. I think Paul brings this out there in Philippians chapter 2, verses 4 through 7. 
He said, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. And he said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God. But he, became, he made himself of no reputation, and he took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. You might say that being a servant is an investment in people rather than an investment in things. Servanthood is also a sacrifice because it does cost us. Inconvenience is nearly always a part of the cost. We see this with the Macedonians who gave beyond their power and in their deep affliction to the poor saints in Jerusalem in 2 Corinthians 8 verses 1 through 4. And yielding one's right is also the very essence of servanthood. Remember Paul, he said he was free from all men, but he still made himself a servant of all men, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 19. Now, servanthood may not seem like a pleasant thing when you start thinking about it, but it really is a privilege. Helping others shouldn't ever be a burden to us. You see, we need the attitude of Paul that he spoke of in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 9 and 10, as we serve. He says, For I am the least of the apostles, then I'm not me to be called an apostle, because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God I am what I am, and his grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain, but I labored more abundantly than they all. Yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Paul served others because of the grace that God bestowed upon him. And if you would just think just for a moment, we also are recipients of God's wonderful grace. And remember Matthew 25, we serve God when we serve others. Now we have to be careful because there are hindrances out there to our servanthood. We can be hindered by serving either the wrong master or too many masters. In fact, Jesus warned us of this in Matthew 6, verse 24. He says, no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. But we, you know, we can also hinder our serv servitude by limiting who we serve and when we serve. We are to do good unto all men, Galatians 6, verse 10, as we have opportunity. Negligence can become a great hindrance. I guess that's why Paul told Timothy, neglect not the gift that is in thee, 1 Timothy 4, 14. If we have an ability, if we have a talent to be able to serve in a certain area, then let us serve in that area with our best effort. Then, of course, pride and self-centeredness will also hinder our service because that prevents us from looking out to others. So let's not ever overlook the importance of serving. True greatness is seen in serving others. Listen to the words of Jesus. It was in our scripture reading a little while ago in Matthew chapter 20, verses 25 through 27. He says, you know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Now this greatness was certainly depicted by Jesus in his example. In verse 28, he said, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. And God will reward your service when you serve him. As Jesus said in Acts 20, verse 35, it is more blessed to give than to receive. Now he can reward us with good, but when we serve, we also open doors for the gospel of Jesus Christ. Listen to what Paul said in 2 Corinthians 4, verse 5. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and our ser ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. 
As Christians, we are to be at God's disposal. Our work and our service is a part of the joy of being in Christ. Solomon said long ago in Proverbs chapter 11, verses 24 and 25, There is that scattereth and yet increaseth. Then there is that withholdeth more than is meat, but it tendeth to poverty. The liberal soul shall be made fat, and he that watereth shall be watered also himself. I want to read something one person once said. He said, the happy people are those who are producing something. The bored people are those who are consuming much and producing nothing. So as servants of Christ, I think we need to strive for excellency and efficiency. To do this, we need to plan and we need to set goals for our work and for our service. It's that important that we need to plan for it. We also need to prepare ourselves for this work. We need a lot of study, meditation, prayer, and think about what we're going to do and what we want to accomplish. And then we have to engage ourselves in this activity, not just think about it, not just talk about it, but we need to become active in this. And then once we start something, we need to finish it. Don't get halfway through and drop it because that's not what God wants. I think he taught a parable about that. The great judgment will involve the accounting of the use of our potential. Not what we could or couldn't do, but what our potential really is. So as a servant, let's influence one another to more active servants, service to the Lord so that we can all have a home in heaven. Hopefully by my example, will be good to encourage you. Your example will also be good to encourage me and to, to encourage others. Now, of course, to begin your service for Jesus Christ, the first thing you have to do is you have to make him your Lord and your master. That means putting him first, not second, certainly not last, but he has to become first in our lives before we can ever serve him. And you also can't labor in his kingdom if you're not in his kingdom. And there's only one way to enter into to his kingdom. Jesus taught Nicodemus at night. You must be born of water and the spirit to be able to enter into the kingdom of God. In other words, you have to obey the gospel, being baptized for the remission of your sins. If there's someone here this evening that has not done that, there's no way you can serve the Lord because you're serving some other master. You haven't made him your master. And if you are in the kingdom... You need to be busy. You need to be doing something, and if you don't know what to do, ask the elders. Ask someone, what can I do to be of service, and then get busy. And if there's anything that anybody needs this evening, whatever it may be, if we can help you, maybe you need the prayers of this congregation, we encourage you to respond to the invitation while together we stand and sing.